I'm Conrad Zero. Uh, put the cell on. It's my fault if you don't like it. So if you have problems, you come talk to me. But there's people with the, that have the staff on the bottom of their badge. They help put this together too. So um, definitely if you're having fun, let them know that you're enjoying yourself. Um, I'll announce our special guest. We're doing a special guest this year, not an MC, because I'm told MCs are like so 20, whatever. <laughs> so our special guest this year won the Newbery Medal in 2017 for her middle grade fantasy novel, The Girl Who Drank the Moon, which spent 51 weeks, 51 weeks, <laughs> on the New York Times bestseller list. Other books include The Witch's Boy, Iron Hearted Violet, The Mostly True Story of Jack, the novella The Unlicensed Magician, and a collection Dreadful Young Ladies. Her work has won the Parents' Choice Award, Parents' Choice Gold Award, World Fantasy Award, Charlotte Huck Honor, and the Texas Library Association Blue Bonnet Award. And, 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 and. And when I told her, uh, when I called, uh, emailed her and said, Would you be special guest at Work Group? She said, Well, can I read? <laughs> And I went, uh, because typically it's been a separate role. I was the MC before, you know, Rhea, your own event, so, um, but you're not, it's not your event, you're a special guest, so can, here's the thing, spoiler alert, when Kelly Barnhill asks if she can read at your event, <laughs> the answer is, oh, well, hell yeah. <laughs> right? So, without further ado, please welcome our very special guest, Kelly Barnhill. me um, in my desire to read. It's, and it's kind of fun to read out loud, especially when it's, when you're reading fiction that nobody can actually buy yet, and maybe never will. I, you know, people ask me what I'm working on, and I say, well, it's kind of a problematic statement because there's the book that I'm contracted to write, uh, to write that's due in, oh, January, and then there's this other book that I'm working on, and I can say that things are shiny and interesting, but I could also say maybe undiagnosed ADHD. We'll see. Um, but I'm not reading any of that. My husband asked me, are you going to read the, the book about the ogre, or are you going to read the book about the 1950s housewives who all turn into dragons and eat their husbands? <laughs> Because last year was the Kavanaugh hearings, and I got a little angry. <laughs> and then it's like wall-to-wall -wall vaginas and stuff. No, I'm not reading that one. I'm reading a pirate story instead. So I've been working on this book for a long time. The thing about being a writer is that there's different kinds of books. There are the books that emerge from our heads like Athena coming out of Zeus. And then there are the books that we have to sit with for a very long time. Sometimes I tell, I, I see kids a lot, I go into schools a lot, and I tell them that all of my books start with a box. Which is true, all of my books do start with a box. And I have to have a box that sits for a very long time and things go into it. Um, and sometimes it's a bit about a character, and sometimes it's a sentence that pleases me, and sometimes it's a lot of research. I've been working on this book for a really long time. I don't know when it'll come out. Maybe never. Maybe in a couple years. I have no idea. Uh, but this is called Dispatch from the Hideous Laboratories of Dr. Otto Vendrecht, because I like to amuse myself. <laughs> and I've been researching this book for a really long time. And I've been doing research on the Holy Roman Empire and the Habsburgs. I've been doing research on alchemy. I've been re doing research on shipbuilding and piracy and poisons. And this is how it begins. When Remy awoke, he felt as though his skull had perhaps shattered during the night. He would have brought his hands to his forehead to make sure his brains had not somehow spilled onto his jacket, but he could not, he realized, as it seems that his wrists were bound and his ankles were bound. And he was apparently in some sort of sack. This, he thought, is unexpected. <laughs> but that wasn't entirely true, not really. If he was being honest with himself, he had been expecting something like this 
though not exactly this, to be fair, for quite some time. He attempted to speak. Nothing came out. His throat was an empty cistern in a dead, calm sea. He tried again. Anjou! Remy croaked. A man grunted on the other side of the rough cloth sack, and he said nothing. Rude, Remy thought, on top of everything else. Anjou, he said again, his vo voice slowly recovering. I know you can hear me. A little courtesy, please. The man sighed. Already awake, are you? The man said. He coughed and spat. Remy could hear a juicy splat hitting the ground. He listened more closely. The sound he heard was not the thudded sound of spittle and cha hitting deck boards. Instead, he heard the bright splatter of liquid hitting stone. Cobblestones, Remy thought. His mother's words came back to him in a painful flash. Only a dullard has the gift of his senses and makes no use of that knowledge that the world is crying out for us to have. Notice everything, my son. Notice and know. Ignoring the growing lump in his throat, the Remy listened closer. He could hear no slap of waves, no cry of seagulls, no familiar rumble of sailors swearing below, uh, over a below decks game of wagers. Instead, he heard the sound of broom grasses easing across a stone stoop, the dripping of drain pipes, oil lamps squeaking on rusty iron hinges, the muffled laughter and clinks and scuffles from basement taverns. And far away, the sounds of stabled horses and goats grunting their pleasure over bags of feed. He was far from home, and Anjou was taking him farther. Of course I'm awake, Ruby's, Remy said peevishly. What did you even give me anyway? His heart was racing. Of course he had been drugged by Anjou of all people. The man coughed and spat again. I knew I had, should have had you dra mix the draft yourself instead of that idiot Rolf. That's one thing we'll miss about you, boy. You could mix potions better than the rest of them. Nimble, too. We'll, make, we'll miss that, and no mistake. We've had some merry escapades, boy, you and me and the rest of them. And we'll miss you terribly. Me, especially. Every day. Go see if I won't. But that's all done now. His voice got thick and he coughed again, and the cough sounded strangely choked, as though he had been crying, but that was impossible, because pirates don't cry. Anjou certainly never did, except that once. But that once didn't count, did it? Even the sea wept that day. Remy felt a cold sweat trickling down his spine. In truth, he had been afraid that this could happen ever since his mother became pale and gaunt and frantic, ever since she began hiding leather-bound bundles in his things, burying them inside of his own bundles of possessions or tucked in the pages of books or shoved at the bottom of his filthiest laundry. Are we going somewhere? Remy had asked her at the time as she slid volumes on cartography and alchemy and the cultural history of the island nations into the stacks of his swashbuckling stories of the pirate here in Anton, terror of the northern seas. Remy had stolen these himself when they had waylaid a pleasure cruise from the emperor's city. It was the first thing he ever stole, but not the last. His mothers took his hand that day, kissed his cheeks, and told him that he mustn't tell, not ever. This will all make sense to you one day, she told him. I promise. But then she died. And they dropped her into the sea like an anchor, and Remy felt his heart drop with her, disappearing without a trace under the waves. Barely a fortnight later, they took harbor in the Venturian coves, putting up the, pl the flags of the empire, also stolen. And then Remy took a, dr a drink of water at dinner that tasted odd, and everything went dark. Please, Anjou. He felt tears stinging in his eyes. He blinked them angrily away. Pirates don't cry. Everyone knows that.
the entire crew of hardened pirates were sobbing as one that day when Remy's mother died notwithstanding. That was extraordinary circumstances, after all. He pulled himself, up, to, he pulled himself together. You don't have to do this. Of course I do, boy. You have no idea how much they're paying for your sorry skin. He checked himself. And the rest of you, too. In case you were wondering, breathing, you understand. I won't let any harm come to you, and that's a promise. Remy could feel the big man's shudder, chose to choke again, and shudder again. And again, his voice was thick. I've known about the money for years. I should have done it long ago, when you were a baby. I was a fool to have waited this long. Remy could feel the slowness of his step and the slump of the great man's shoulders. Despite his moniker, Anjou the Awful was a good man for a pirate, fair, judicious, rarely violent. He preferred to operate in stealth and subterfuge. He wanted people to know they had been robbed blind and to go on living. He wanted his name known and his stories told. It was good for business. Anjou also loved Remy's mother. That was obvious. He loved her and loved her and loved her. But the mad jellyfish is my home, Remy said. He tried to swallow his sobs. Please let me stay. Anjou, papa, please. The big man laughed ruefully. It's your papa boy. That should be obvious. And you went a pirate. And you never were. And you will, never will be neither. These words cut Remy to the bone. Not the father bit, he knew that already. When he was little, living on the pirate ship, he used to imagine it was so, but he was not an idiot. Anjou was huge, with ice blue eyes. His footsteps struck the earth with purpose, making the mountains rumble, making the ship shake every time he moved. Skin the color of rum, yellow hair blindingly bright. Remy, on the other hand, was small, brown, and clever, light and nimble as a cricket quick and silent in the water like a seal. He was made for water, not a pirate! Ah, couldn't be true. They were walking through the city, that much was obvious, and it was night. A horse clopped with a heavy gait by a nearby, along a nearby road. Remy could smell the cesspools and privies as they passed by. He held his hand over his nose, but it didn't help. He could cry out, of course he could, but he didn't think it would do him any good. Remy had been in Venteria before, that sagging, waterlogged city of wasted wealth and obsolete aristocracy and criminal opportunity. A boy in a sack was as common as the hordes of feral cats. And anyway, it was too late. Anjou stopped, hesitated, and he sighed, and then he knocked on the door. <laughs>